Good morning, church family and friends. Again, we are gathered here this morning for worship. Some of you may not know if you're not local uh, here in, in the Frederick, Maryland area, but we have temporarily paused our live in-person worship gatherings here within the church building. So we've been online exclusively the past few weeks. Well, last week and again this week. And we are watching it on a weekly basis to see, you know, how the number of cases are out there and the general health within the community. You know, we want to protect our church family as best we can. And uh, at the same time, we're looking forward to being able to gather again soon, hopefully within the next few weeks. Hopefully we'll see the numbers reduce and maybe just a little better, under, more under control. So please continue to pray. Pray for your church family and your friends, uh, those who are battling with COVID. And, you know, we pray for a quick, quick recovery for them. And we, you know, we want to continue to get back to normal life together. Let's pray before we get started. Precious Lord, thank you for your guidance. We're grateful that we know that you are in control here. We need that reminder sometimes. We need to be reminded that you're still in control because sometimes it feels like things are just out of control. But we trust in your promises. We trust your promises from your word, from the Bible, that you have given to us, your word that has been given to us through the scriptures. There is never one moment or one second where you take a break where you take a rest. You are constantly watching and caring and guiding and, and running things. And life works out as you desire. We praise you for that. But of course, the challenge for us here is trusting you, trusting your plan and your purpose. And we know that resisting it seems silly, but yet still we do it, right? Our own stubbornness, our own sin nature will cause us to resist and still try and make life go our own way. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for that straying and for not attending to you, for rebelling and not representing you well. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for not loving and caring for others as you've called us to. And I just pray this morning, Lord, that your message here, that this passage that you have for us in Galatians chapter 5, that you would help us to recognize that you have given us all that we need, that it is sufficient. That fact, that truth should encourage us and inspire us. And we just pray now, Lord, that your message would be clear. That it would pierce our hearts, that we would understand it. That we would understand not only what it means, but also that we would understand how we can live it how we can live because of this passage. For those who are struggling this morning with illness, Lord, we lift them up in prayer. We ask that your spirit would encourage them and give them healing. Those that are battling with relationship challenges, we ask that your spirit would intervene there. That you would soften hearts awaken minds and allow them to resolve their conflicts. For those who are struggling with material needs, money and food, shelter,
Lord, I pray that they would find help and that they would recognize that that help is always from you and your grace alone. Thank you, Jesus, for working here this morning. I already know you have been working. You've been preparing our hearts and our minds for this lesson already. And we pray now that we would receive it well. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Those of you who were with us last week, hopefully you remember that we discussed one word. Mess. Messes. Do you remember? Specifically, how our lives together can be messy. But it's worth it, right? Amen? Paul describes how we can work through the mess together. And in verse 13, I'm going back now to verse 13, talks about how we serve one another with love. And that sounds great, right? We should want to serve each other. We should want to be there for one another, to help one another, to be present, committed. Because as brothers and sisters, we have the same Savior, the same Father. We will spend eternity together. But honestly, just because we should do it doesn't mean we will do it, right? I mean, I can tell you what the Bible says here, and that's easy to say it, right? Just to read the words. But... Suppose you don't want to deal with all that mess. You have enough problems on your own, right? Your issues with your family, your struggles at work. And then you have to worry about loving this other person too. Caring about another person. I mean, honestly, sometimes we just have no desire. We know we should, but we just don't. Especially that person we really don't like. And you know, when everything works out well, when relationships are good, still loving and serving is not easy, right? Think about that. We struggle with our sin nature, even with people that we love and care about, right? We're selfish, we're lazy, we have pride. So then take someone that we don't even get along with, someone that we have a personal conflict with, when there's a misunderstanding, when they have really immature behavior. Then we have to humble ourselves to make sure their needs are met. Forget it, right? I mean, really, be honest with yourselves for a minute. We think our attitude is that they don't deserve our kindness, right? Now, of course, we would never say that out loud. We would never admit it to other people. But that is our thoughts. That, that is our feelings sometimes, that they don't deserve our kindness. It's a battle. So what do we do? Well, the Bible is clear. You can't do anything alone. There's nothing you can do alone. You cannot love enough, show enough kindness. You can't, I can't. Sacrificing your time, making an effort. To be honest, if it was just up to you, most of the time you wouldn't do it. I mean, maybe once in a while. When you have time, you might make a little time to do it. But on an ongoing basis, I mean, you could be watching this morning, watching this lesson, you could make a decision, you know what, I will be completely humble, I will set aside my pride, I'm going to work as hard as I can to love that person well. But the Bible says that you, on your own, will fail, you will fail in that. You may have be well-intentioned, you may be sincere, you may work hard, but you alone will fail. But the Bible also says that love doesn't begin with you. 
you don't have to create that feeling, to come up with that feeling. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, God is love. Not that he has love, but he feels love. God is love. Love is who he is and it comes from him. He gives us love through the Holy Spirit. So if God himself, the Spirit, is not within us, if he is not within you, he can, you cannot love other people as he intended, as he commanded. It's impossible. Now, I've mentioned before, and I think it's worth explaining again, people who don't know God, and there are many people out there who do not know God, they still sense and experience part of his love. Now, remember, all love comes from God. But even if they don't know him, they can still experience it, even without the Holy Spirit in their hearts, ruling their hearts and minds. The love that they're experiencing is incomplete. It's incomplete. It's partial love. So last month, we, my family got hit with COVID, just like a lot of you are experiencing right now. And I lost my sense of taste for a while. And I, I know some people still haven't gotten it back. I was fortunate to get it back relatively quickly. Now, losing my sense of taste and smell, I still had to eat, right? So I did still eat, but I couldn't fully enjoy what I was eating. I mean, I'd sit down to eat and my mind was ready to enjoy a meal, right? I knew what that chili was supposed to taste like. I was hungry and ready. And as soon as I ate it, it was like my mind was working so hard to communicate with my taste buds, but just wasn't there. It was so disappointing. I was looking for that flavor, but it was just missing. I just couldn't detect it. Now, thankfully, it's not true, but let's say I was born with no taste or sense of smell. Would my life still be good? Of course it would be. I would still eat. I would still be able to enjoy what's there. But I would never know what I was missing, right? I would never know. It's just like love without God's spirit. It's incomplete. And what's missing, those people can't understand. They don't understand what God wants for them. They're just getting a little taste, a little hint of his love without fully experiencing the love God gives. Anyway, the point is, Serving one another through love requires the help of his spirit. It's an essential part. He has to be working in our lives, in our hearts, showing us. And we can become who he wants us to be, more like Jesus, for one another, but also for the world. Remember that you, as a believer, are his witness meaning his example, his example for love. So many people wonder, you know, what does true love mean? What does true love look like? They should look to Jesus for that. But does that happen? Paul wants his church to understand that while you may feel like that type of love just isn't possible today, but his spirit is enough. His spirit is sufficient.
and he will help you. Let's look at verses 16 and 17 this morning. We've been studying uh, chapter 5, and it's, it's broken down for us, so we're looking at verses 16 and 17 today. So Paul's writing and he says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You won't do that. The sinful nature wants to do evil and the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. This passage may feel discouraging, right? Like really we can't, but it's actually an amazing promise here because daily life is full of struggles and temptations. But if we are willing to submit and allow the spirit full control, you will overcome your sin nature. In Greek, in the Greek language, Paul says, if you allow the spirit to guide your life, your sin nature has no chance, no chance That's how much you can depend on him. Now, you know, we mentioned last week, the flesh, the sin is still alive within us, right? And it's powerful. It's strong. Relationships, decisions, moral choices. We know what God wants. And then we know what we want. And there's a constant struggle. It's a constant battle between the two. But Paul is clear. He says, if you will pursue and trust the Holy Spirit, he will win. Not you. He will win through you. Again, the spiritual battle against your sin nature. It's impossible to win that battle alone. It doesn't matter how strong you feel how strong you think you are to handle it. You can't. But the Spirit wins it for us. Now, do you really believe that? That you can overcome your sin? Do you believe that? Do you believe that your Spirit wants to protect you? God doesn't want us to struggle, to battle. I mean, just a simple everyday example, you face someone with an attitude and your first reaction is like, just walk away or maybe quarrel back with them. You're confronted with their anger, their arrogance. Maybe you feel disappointed, jealous. Will you quit? We say, well, my reaction isn't godly. My reaction isn't holy. But I mean, that's me. That's who I am. So I can't help it. How many times have we seen that excuse through the years? Well, that's me. I just can't help it. Okay. Well, alone, yes, that's true. You can't help it. But brothers and sisters, you're not alone. God himself, through the Holy Spirit, is there. If you are a believer, he lives within you. Verse 18 through 21.
But when you are directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation to the law. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, meaning using magic, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. The spirit helps us battle our sin nature. But also the spirit protects us from God's judgment. Have you noticed God's judgment in that passage? Those who live a lifestyle of those sins will not inherit his kingdom. That's his judgment. Verse 18 again, when the spirit rules you, you are not under the law. So what does that mean? The Holy Spirit helps us to pursue holiness. Our actions, our thoughts, our decisions are not for ourselves and our own selfish pleasures, but for him. Before we accepted Jesus, before the Holy Spirit took reign in our lives, we faced God's judgment and his punishment, and we deserved it because we violated his law. I mean, we cannot follow his laws to a T. So that meant we could not get into the kingdom of heaven. It was impossible. If you try to live a good life, and many people out there will tell you, you know, I try my best. I live a good life. I'm a good person. Okay, but if the Holy Spirit is not within you, God will judge your life. And compare, and will compare it to his perfect law. Which means comparing your life to his perfect law you cannot meet up. You will fail. Paul wants us to understand that if the Holy Spirit truly leads your life, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, God's wrath and his judgment, you don't have to worry about doesn't have to be feared because Jesus died for your failures. All those areas where you fail, Jesus died for all of that. So now God can look at your life and measure its goodness to Jesus. Jesus' perfect obedience is what he sees. And that passes all of the tests. And that gets applied to you. His perfection, his holiness. God judges his work for you because you had accepted Jesus and his work on the cross. You notice Paul's warning here in verse 21. He says, if the spirit does not rule your life, if sin still rules you, meaning how you live, the decisions you make, how you think, verse 21b, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom.
Paul's concern here is a serious one. Because still today, after many years of teaching and explaining and expanding on the gospel message, still people believe that their own actions can save them. Do you think that you can follow God's law and not worry about sin and how it impacts you? For example, ignoring the needs of your brothers and sisters, failing to love them, ignoring the needs of your spouse or your children, Oh, but you go to church and you never miss a Bible study. Do you honestly believe that's okay? Do you really want God to judge your life? And hope that maybe you've done enough to get into heaven. Still, some people believe that. Some people say, I hope I've done enough. Well, you haven't. You can't do enough. You have to rely fully on Jesus' work, on his death for your sins. It has nothing to do with your work and your actions. Again, it is only God's Holy Spirit that can empower us for love. Because he created love. Remember, the two greatest laws that Jesus mentioned, really it goes back to Deuteronomy, but Jesus also brought them up again. The two greatest commandments both require love. First, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Try, try it yourself and see what happens. Try to love fully, consistently, fairly, every day. Try to love your children fully after a really rough week with them. Try to love your spouse after they've failed you. Try to love your brother or sister after they've hurt you. Any love that you have is from the Lord. And that's why Paul described this, the fruits of the Spirit. Chapter 3, verses 22 and 23 talks about spiritual fruit. It really means the evidence of the Holy Spirit living and working within you. You want to know for sure if the Spirit is there? This is the evidence of the Spirit being there. And the first one that's mentioned is love. Take a look. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. When his spirit lives within us, when God rules your life, people will see that. They will experience those things mentioned in verses 22 and 23, love, peace, joy, patience, and so on. And you know, all of those characteristics, some are easy, some are not. 
for some of us, God created us with some of those characteristics being easy. For example, some people just radiate joy all the time. They're just a joyful person, but they have no patience. Other people may be so good, just so good, but maybe in terms of self-control, some days are better than others. None of us are perfect people because sin has ruined us. Sin has ruined the world. But becoming holy, becoming more like Jesus is a lifelong process. At the same time, when people meet or see or interact with the church family, his spiritual fruit, the evidence of his rule in their lives can be seen. It's obvious to others. They see goodness. They see faithfulness. They see self-control. Because again, the Holy Spirit living within us helps us respond with patience, helps us to show kindness, helps us to become more gentle. So now maybe you know, okay, all of that happens with the spirit living inside, ruling me. Okay. So does he really live within us? Well, ask yourself. Be honest with yourself. Am I really loving my brothers and sisters like Jesus? That's a great place to start. I mean, I just mentioned it's a lifelong process. So maybe you say, well, I haven't yet. But okay, do you love them today more than yesterday? Can you look back and recognize how he challenged and pushed you and helped you grow? Have you reached out? Have you taken risks? Risks within relationships. Have you been willing to step out, to speak the truth, to love people who, quote unquote, don't deserve it? Can you feel their pain? Can you empathize, offer comfort, give them peace? Show patience. Patience that you didn't even know that you had, but now all of a sudden you realize you're becoming more patient. That is evidence of the Spirit helping you become more faithful, pursuing truth. That is evidence of the Spirit guiding your life. Last, verse 24 and 25. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives, every area of our lives. Notice Paul says, living with the spirit requires something. It requires something. All of your sinful passions and desires need to be crucified. 
It's a metaphor, of course. It means that Jesus' work on the cross, his death for your sins, you must trust and believe that when Jesus died, our sins died too. And you hold on to Jesus because John chapter 15 verse 5 says, Apart from me, meaning Jesus, you can do nothing. Alone, good luck. The joy of letting Jesus work through you means all of that resistance, all of that pride can just stop. If you abide, meaning you accept and obey, just trust without resistance, know that he is sufficient. You say, Lord, I believe that you have given me enough strength, enough wisdom, enough power, enough love. I believe that you have given me everything that I need here. The Spirit will create a new, a genuinely new person. And we've seen it. We have seen his transformation in people. We have seen it. If you follow Jesus Christ, it has happened within your life as well. Who you are now is not the same person that you were before. Life with the Holy Spirit is not just a neat idea, not just a neat feeling. It means every single area of your life has been impacted by him, has been changed, and he rules, meaning you give up that control. Your faith leads you. His word, the Bible, teaches you. It shows you Jesus. It feeds your soul. And what's more, you know him more. And the more you know him, the more you value and cherish that relationship, the more content you are. You don't have to chase and look for something else. You're not living wondering what else is out there, wondering what you might be missing. Because you have, what you have is sufficient. Your heart is full and overflowing. Psalm 73 says, All that I want in heaven and on earth is you. I want that. More and more I want that, and hopefully you do too. My sins have been crucified. And I want to abide with him and his spirit rule my life completely. I want his spirit to give me enough, enough strength, enough wisdom, enough family, friends, strangers. I want them to experience the joy and peace and patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I want his love to overwhelm them. What about you? Do you feel the same? Let's pray. Let's ask for his help. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this lesson. It reminds us what is there for us. If we're just willing to plug in, if we're just willing to receive all that you have for us, abundant 
overflowing life. God, help us. Help us win that battle. Sorry, win the battle for us, please. Fill us. Fill us with yourself. And in return, we will praise you. Amen. Join.